Hello everyone, welcome to another session for our ARD in the BART exam. For today's topic, we are going to uh, continue with our series for agriculture and farm machinery for our part 2, right? Please don't forget to subscribe. You can also press the bell icon for further notifications, right? And if you've liked the video, don't forget to hit the thumbs up button as well. So first and foremost, we're going to talk about water harvesting, right? So what, uh, what is water harvesting? Water harvesting, it means that we are uh, capturing of the rain when it falls uh, on the capturing site, right? Uh, it can be in a form of a runoff, right? It can be on a, either on your village or in a, or in a town, right? So, uh, and when we do this water harvesting, it takes up a measure to keep the water clean by it does uh, by not allowing the pollutant or activities to take place in the catchment, right? So um, catchment, if you're a uh, catchment, it means that uh, it is an area or a place where the water, the rainwater is falls off, right? So from that area, uh, this rainwater will be uh, flowing into the rivers and streams and thereby it will be joining the oceans or the seas, right? So this is something on water harvesting. Generally, a water harvesting can be normally defined as a activity of direct collection of the rainwater, right? So it can be stored directly or it can be also recharged in the groundwater as well. And some of the examples of uh, these uh, or the techniques or the purpose for rain uh, for water harvesting can be able to provide uh, natural drinking water. It would also help in the irrigation purposes. It can also increase the groundwater recharge and it will uh, reduce the seawater ingress in the coastal areas so that whatever water whatever rain water is being fallen on the ground doesn't go uh, doesn't run off and it doesn't flow into the ocean which will be uh, not useful for our daily activities right so these is the these are some of the main purposes of rain water harvesting right so now let's go to uh, different types of uh, rain water harvesting uh, sorry uh, different types of water harvesting the first one here is rain water harvesting the second is flood water harvesting number third is ground water harvesting now let's look at the detail of all of these three types of water harvesting right so the first one here is rain water harvesting and rain water harvesting basically we will be collecting the rain water right it can be in the form of a rooftops or it can be a micro catchment water harvesting or a macro catchment water harvesting so we will be i'll be explaining all of these three types of rain water harvesting slowly so let us understand what a rain water harvesting is so Rainwater harvesting it is defined as a method for inducing and will also collect and storing and conserving the local surface runoff for agriculture purposes in arid and semi-arid areas. So if your example in this picture, the rainwater falls on the rooftop and then this water is collected into a storage tank, right? So these can be further later on, can be used for some agriculture purposes. It can also be used for domestic purposes as well. Uh, it, it is mostly common in the arid regions or the semi-arid regions where the rainfall is lesser and uh, when we compare it to the other regions, right? So uh, as we've talked about, it we have three types of rainwater harvesting the one first one is water collected from the rooftops so this is basically uh, this th uh, this picture depicts the first uh, water harvesting technique from the rooftop where the rain will fall on the roof and then from the roof uh, we will be collect uh, through a pipeline or through a structure it will be connected to a storage water tank right so in that way the water will be conserved in it and the second one here is micro catchment of the water harvesting right so in micro uh, micro catchment of water harvesting it is a collection or a method of uh, collecting the surface runoff of the water right so it will be uh, we will be collecting it from a small catchment area and it will will uh, and we will store this catch uh, the water which is collected from the small catchment area into the adjacent infiltration basin right so this infiltration basin or the basin where the water is collected will be planted near the tree or a plantation crop or a bush or along with the annual crops right 
So that is something on the micro catchments, water harvesting. And now let's go to macro catchments. My macro catchment is just a bigger structure, bigger form of a micro catchment. So here in macro uh, catchment, we will be uh, harvesting the water from the runoff uh, from the hill slopes. Okay, uh, in a hill slope, there will be a catchment, a catchment where they will be collecting all the water, rainwater sources, right? So from there, we will collect it and through a pipeline or through a conveyed uh, kind of structure it will be connected to the coppering area which is in the lower side of the flat terrain right let me just give an example for it suppose this is a hill slope right and this is a flat terrain right so here uh, suppose this is the catchment area where the water falls and from there we will be connecting a basin or a storage tank or it will be connected through it and then the water from this area will be given out into the flat terrain or it will be conveyed to the flat terrain where the, some of the agriculture crops will be growing. Right, so this is something on the macro catchment of the water harvesting. Now let's go to another one which is a flood water harvesting. Right, so uh, the flood water harvesting it can be de defined as a collection and storage of creek flow for irrigation use. So the flood water harvesting, it is also known as a large catchment water harvesting or a spate irrigation. Creek flow would be your rivers or the small stream. The rivers or the, the rivers or the uh, streams they are mostly formed due to the rainwater, right? And through through this through the small river or streams, this flood water harvesting, we will collect the water from the streams or this creek flow and we will use it for the irrigation. It will be stored first and then it will be used for the irrigation on later on. Right? Right? And this is also known as the catch, large catchment water harvesting or a spade irrigation. Remember guys, there are two types of flood water harvesting. The first one here is flood water harvesting within the stream bed. And the second one here is flood water harvesting uh, through uh, the method called the diversion. Right. So in the first one, in the flood water harvesting with stream bed, the water flow is usually dammed. Okay, and uh, as a result, it inundates the valley bottom of the floodplain. Right, so and the water is forced to infiltrate, and the wetted area can be used for the agriculture or pasture improvement. Right, and then the second one, in the case of these uh, flood water division, suppose the water, the water water, or the normal uh, river water, or the dam water, it is forced. Uh, the normal water is it's forced to leave its natural stream okay so for example uh, so this is the mountain and here we have a normal a river stream right so in this uh, type of flood water harvesting we will be making a diversion a structure or diversion by burns or any of that structures and then through this it will be created a different diversion for example, two streams will be created and this one will be used for irrigation or for other agriculture purposes, right, in the lower terrain. But these are something about the flood water harvesting. And now let's go to our groundwater harvesting. And groundwater harvesting, it is a, uh, it is a basically a new term. It is a new uh, process of water harvesting. And it is employed to cover traditional as well as unconventional ways of water extractions, right? But the famous uh, groundwater method of this groundwater harvesting is the canard system, right? And let's talk about this canard system. What is this canard system? A canard system, it consists of basically a long tunnel, okay, or a conduit. Uh, which uh, which is leading from a well dug at the reliable source of the groundwater. For example, uh, a mother well will be there, and from there a long tunnel is connected. Okay, and from these these um, uh, mother well, these are usually dug on the base of a hill, right, or in the foothills of the mountain ridge, so that when the water, uh, when all the water seepage will come through the groundwater and will form under this well. Right, so these are usually uh, below the base of the hill or a uh, lower terrain. Right, so and from these, the tunnel is connected, and from this tunnel, which leads to the mother uh, well slopes, it will be gradually downwards, uh, gradually formed or gradually built downward the valley below, and it will be used for other agriculture purposes or any domestic purposes or for the storage of the water. Right, so I hope it's clear. And now let's go to our water harvesting techniques. So 
we've talked about all the water harvesting uh, stru structures right now let's go to our different types of techniques that we usually use to harvest the water the first one here is a runoff harvesting okay so under runoff harvesting we have contour buns so runoff harvesting would include the water runoff that is usually thrown off due to the uh, due to the rain right so uh, all this water runoff that has been uh, that uh, that will go uh, not in use will be used to uh, harvest it so through these methods we will be able to harvest or collect these one of water right so the first one here is a contour bun so first and foremost the this, this method involves construction of the buns or the contour of the catchment so if you're asking what a bun is a bun would be an air uh, would be like an embankment or um, you will dig it up here and then we will create a uh, suppose for example we will be uh, digging up the soil from here and we'll be converting here and which will make it into a bun right so this is known as a bun right so and on the contour of the catchment area okay so uh let me just give a uh, rough example for you all to understand suppose this is a land okay so, so this is a hill it's mostly in the hilly region right and now so uh, another one another example this is another hill okay so here i'm going to draw a contour here i won't be drawing any contours okay so the first one here in the contour one so we'll be making a bun right a bun will be made in such a way like this around the hill slope and here we won't be using any bun right so here in this method uh we will be constructing a bun here in such a way that when the water or the rain it falls off it won't run off instead it will uh, capture the water right it will slow the force of the water or the um, the fall of the water slowly so that it will capture it here and it will store it here so here what we can also do is that as you can see here uh, a crop can also be grown Right, so in this way, it will also conserve the water, and the water can be used efficiently for the trees or any plants or crops here. Right, so these are something about the contour buns. Okay, and now uh, let's just discuss more about it. So this uh, buns they hold flowing surface runoff in the area located between the two buns. Right, and the height of the contour bun generally range from about zero point three zero to one meter, and length of about ten to few hundred meters right so try to remember this uh points right and i hope it's clear now let's go to another one which is a semicircular loop so in this semicircular loop it's almost like the contour bun but here uh the bun is made uh, in a semicircular way right so uh let me just uh give an example again so it's usually made in a semicircular way here as you can see in the picture right so here in between a plant or a crop will be grown so for example here uh land or hill again right so these uh buns will be made in such a way like this will, will be constructed this way right and a tree for example is grown here so when the water falls off all the water can be stored here right and the excess water which falls can be used here instead so in that way we won't be losing any water and the water will be stored right so let me just tell uh, the tips of the semicircular are furnished on the contour okay and the water contributed to the area is collected within a hoop to the maximum depth equal to the height of the embankment so the ex the excess water from this hoop right from these from these hoops will flow into the another hoop okay so just discharge from the point around the tip from this tip will be gone or will be flowing to the next lower loop right so this is something about the semicircular hoop and now let's go to a trapezoidal so based on the trapezoidal bun will be an uneven square uh, quadrilateral or uneven quadrilateral right quadrilateral will be having four sides right so it's basically a square or a rectangular right but then this won't be in an even form this will be like in uneven form so for example here in this picture you can see on un uneven four sides 
right? So here, the bun is also, it's more like the semicircular loop only. It's just the main difference here is that this is in a uh, trapezoidal uh, shape, right? And here, the tip of the bun wings, they are placed on the contour. The water runoff yielded from the watershed is collected into a carpet area, the excess water around the tips, right? So here, uh, you can see uh, in this, this is a uh, terrain, right? And here, the trapezoidal, trapezoidal bun is made and the crops are usually grown here. And through this, uh, even if the water, they won't, even if there's a high rainfall and higher runoff, then it will from here, it will also come here and it fall off to the another trapezoidal bunt and from here it will fall off to the another trapezoidal bunt. Right, so these are something on the trapezoidal bunts. I hope it's clear. And now let's go to our rock catchment. So this, this is another form of a harvesting struck techniques, right? So here, uh, basically, uh, the water runoff will fall in the rock. Right, so from here, the runoff, the runoff will be there, but then uh, these will be con uh, a, cons a dam will be constructed uh, here, and in that way, a pipeline will be joined from this dam, and from through this pipeline, it will be connected into a storage uh, water of uh, sorry uh, storage water structures. Right from there, it will be used for the other agriculture um, purposes or whatever you need the water. For. Four, right so here uh, the rock catchment these are exposed rock surfaces right so which are used for collecting the runoff and in a inner part as a depressed area okay so it has to be in a depressed area okay so uh, the water harvesting under this method can be explained as the when the rainfall uh, on the exposed rock surface the runoff takes place very rapidly but there is very little loss okay so the runoff will happen very excessively but then there is a loss as the water uh, will be seeped through the rock right because a rock a water cannot be seeped through the rock so in that way there is a lesser uh, lesser loss and in that way we can save all the water through this dam which is uh, which has been constructed here on the near the edge of the hill right and from there we can directly get all the water that has been run off through the uh, water to the rock so an example a live example here is in this picture so for example here this uh, water will be coming through here and it will be collected in this area right and since the dam here you can see the dam is built around here and then somewhere around here they will be constructing a pipe which will go down the terrain and then which will be stored somewhere in a some uh, proper structure and from there we can use it for the later purpose okay so this is something about the rock catchment and now let's go to our ground catchment in this method a large area of ground is used as a catchment for runoff yield the runoff is diverted into a storage tank where it is stored Right, so it's almost the same as the uh, it's almost the same as uh, the rock uh, catch. But it's just that the main difference here is that here we, uh, in that previous one we were using the rock, but here we are using using a normal soil over ground. The main pro uh, the main difference here is that uh, like the ground where it is clear, the ground where we're going to use a catch as a catchment, uh, the vegetation or uh, the vegetation will be cleared out and it will be compacted very well. So the whole mechanism is the same. It's just that the main difference here is that it is a, this thing is in the ground, whereas the other one was in the rock, right? And now let's go to our long-term runoff harvesting structures. These are also under these harvesting structures, but these are mostly for the long-term purposes. The previous ones were for the short-term purposes, okay? And now let's go to our long-term purposes. We have two structures, <clears throat> basically. The first one is the rock ponds, and then the second one is the embankment type reservoir. So in the dig of ponds, the ponds, these are constructed by excavating the soil from the ground surface. So suppose this is a normal ground surface. So in this dig of uh, ponds, what will we do? We will excavate or take out the uh, land or the soil from the, take out the ground and we will make a pond, right? So in these ponds, they may be fed by the groundwater or by the surface runoff or by both. So these water uh, will be filled by, it can be either due to the groundwater, right? Or either it can be due to the surface runoff of this normal water, okay? And, and after that, these also involve more construction costs than the others, right? But they are generally recommended when the embankment type ponds are not economically feasible. Okay, so the these they got pond they can be recommended when maximum utilization of harvested runoff water is possible for increasing the production of some important crops. Okay, these can be uh, 
constructed where we can make a bunt around in and around these the on the edge of the ponds or it can be done with the help of a lining of the bricks okay so these will uh, can also be done by plastering it with cement right to ensure maximum storage and to reduce the seepage loss so all these will be uh, the pond can be plastered with a cement or it can be lined with the brick as well so that when you plaster it with the cement or with the brick then it will also help in the reduction of the seepage of the or the loss of the water from the pond so these are something about the dugout ponds right now let's go to our embankment uh, type reservoir okay so these types of reservoirs these are constructed by forming a dam or an embankment or a value or depression on the catchment area okay so a reservoir basically here uh, normally a reservoir is constructed okay so it can be in the form of a dam right or an embankment on the valley of an area right so here the runoff water is collected into this reservoir and it is used as per the requirement for whatever purposes that you want to use this for okay so the storage capacity of the reservoir is determined on the basis of water requirement for various demands and also availability runoff from the catchment right so here in this uh, picture i've see i've given an example uh, a picture for an embankment reservoir right so this is the hilly re region and below on the lowest surface we'll be creating an embankment right or in, it can be in the form of a dam right so in that way we will be collecting the water right so these are something on the uh, embankment type of reservoirs mm. now let's go to our water uh, watershed development and management okay so uh, i think in our soil water con soil conservation topic we've already discussed something about the watershed development and also watershed what is a watershed so uh, if you guys have so here i won't be going in detail about what a watershed is or, or what a watershed development is so just uh, if you haven't uh, catch that video please just go back to that video uh, and you can check it out and you can uh, understand what a watershed is right and so now here i'm just going to talk about roughly about why we need why do we do all this watershed development and why there is a need for watershed uh, management right so basically this uh this watershed management is a wider concept which is related to this rainwater harvesting okay so the watershed approach it enables uh, more of a holistic development in an area which involves uh, three major uh, topics which can be conservation regeneration and we can also use the judicious use of the natural resources of that particular area right so the increasing pace of development works and the steep and rise of population has uh, led to a large deforestation in the forest mm -hmm. right and so because of this mm -hmm. a lot of there has been a lot of reduction in the water losses in the vegetation and uh, in the normal because of that as well there has been a degradation in the soil even the soil as well we have lost a lot of wildlife and all of that so and to this the this watershed management aims to tackle all these problems through a well-defined management uh, techniques and structures right so these uh, the the main uh, problem here is that the uh, through all this deforestation and uh, all these activities the drainage areas of these rivers and the streams which reach the drainage river of these areas would be also known as the watershed okay so these has been particularly affected the worst okay so and um, this has resulted in excessive loss of the topsoil and there has been an increased intensity of floods which is mostly common during the monsoon season also right so even there has been a reduction in the groundwater level as well as in the low season uh low season availability of the streams and the rivers as well so because of this it has affected this whole watershed uh, activities to correct these measures are some of the measures of some of the objectives that that underlie these would be the reduction the first one being the reduction of soil the second one is augment of the soil moisture and the third one is retarded drainage of the water okay so these are the main three objectives right so after this these restoration uh, the measures taken for this would be the restoration of the vegetation cover to bring the watershed close to its original pristine condition okay so the first one is restoration number one, second is artificial and treatment 
to strike a balance between the needs of development and on the other hand protection of the water shed on the other right so these are the two main points that you have to remember when you are focusing on the watershed development and management and now let's go to some of the techniques and the according, according to the nature of terrains right so according uh, on the nature of terrains if it's on the hilltop or in on the upper reaches of the watershed then afforestation will help in the uh, watershed management right and the second one is if it's in a steep slope with lower uh, with little lower down then will be have the improvement techniques with the development of grasslands suppose if it's in the lower parts of watersheds then it will be contour bunding and terracing of agriculture fields it will be contour trenching it can be contour cultivation strip cropping gully plugging stream bank protection you can also have farm ponds and we have controlled and regulation of the grazing. So these are some of the improved techniques which we can use for the water harvest ma watershed management. Right now, let's go in a bit detail with all these uh, management strategies. Right, the first one is contour trenching. Okay, so they consist of an excavating shallow intermittent trenches along the land slope and forming a small earthen bund on the downstream side. Okay. And the plantation is done on the bund to stabilize the bund. Okay, and the trenches retain the runoff and help in establishment of the plantation made on the bund. So, for example, so here in the first picture, as you can see here, right here it consists. They will be we will be excavating some of the shallow independent trenches, right? So we'll be taking out some part of the soil and we'll be making a trench in this way. Okay, and a bund will be formed around like this. So this will form your bund, this area will form your bund, okay, right, so here we can grow the vegetation, right, so here in this, uh, this is more of a uh, far off view, so in that way you'll be able to understand here, suppose this is, this is a hill slope, right guys, and now here they, we have made some of these trenches, as you can see here, and here we will be growing some of the plantations or we will be growing some of the plants in and around on the buns downstream of the buns right so these plantation will we will help in establishment of the uh, bund which has been made on the bund right so this is a very good water conservation method where it can also uh, where all the water won't be lost right and so it can use to conserve and it can have the plants or which of uh, the plants which are grown in that area will have the ultimate uh, moisture that they need for the normal growth and development right so in that way it can uh, yield more as well so these are something on the contour trenching and now let's go to control uh, grazing and control grazing as the name suggests we will be controlling the grazing of the animals or the livestock right so here uh, the grazing of the hill slopes by cattle the new the vegetation cover and also it also accelerates the soil erosion right so as such grazing of hill slope should be allowed in a controlled manner so here suppose uh, for example uh, in control grazing and then um, another technique would be fencing right we can even do uh, maybe make a permanent fencing or maybe a temporary fencing in which that um, the livestock will be allowed to graze for a certain extent only and in that way a person or um, will be able to know that okay this this particular area is only for the grazing purposes and in that area it can be some of the pasture land can be controlled due to this right another method can also be for example suppose this is a piece of land a huge acre of land right so let me such subdivide it into four so for, for example uh, another one here suppose if you're grazing it here in the first season that we can graze it another one and in the second season third season we can graze it here and four season we can graze it here so it's more like a, a crop rotation technique but here it's just like a grazing rotation right so this grazing rotation uh, not only would it help in conserving the uh, forest forest and conserving the uh, pasture lands in that area right so it can also help in um, um, help in um, lessen the soil erosion as well and it would also help in conserving the vegetation and the preserving more of the uh, vegetation so these are something on the controlled grazings and now let's go to a bench terraces a bench terraces is also practiced mostly in the hill slopes right so here in this we will be making a terrace a flat 
surface in a, such a terrace way or maybe in a stepwise way okay so here they consist of a series of a platform of excavated on the slope okay so depending on the rainfall conditions and crops to be grown terraces has contracted flat it can be sloping inwards or it can be sloping outwards Right, we have also discussed about uh, so the different types of these terraces in our soil, in our soil topic. Right, so uh, try to go back and if you are, if you don't remember, try to go back to that video. You can you can check it out again. Right, so here in this way we have uh, in this uh, sloping inwards would be suppose uh, this the contour will be made in such a way. Right, so the slope will be inwards. Right, and another one here the slope would be outwards. Right, so these are the three types of terraces. Right, so uh, these are something it all will help in the water. Uh, obviously, it will also reduce the runoff, and it will also help in the um, soil conservation, and it also help with the soil erosion as well. And now let's go to our contour cultivation. In this contour cultivation, it is carrying out a different uh, when uh, the agriculture practices the or the operations like plowing or the plantation or are the or other intercultural operations these are uh, usually carried out in a horizontal lines across this sloping land as you can see in this uh, picture right and see this uh, such practices it help in retaining the rainwater and also retard the erosion so these measures these are effective when the land slope is about two percent or that is less okay so guys these are something on the i hope this is uh right here i think this is self-explanatory right and now let's go to our strip cropping a strip cropping is another way or another form of a cropping pattern right so here in this uh strip cropping we will for example here we will be growing a resistant uh, crop which is a resistant crop to erosion right and here we will be growing our normal agriculture crops or any other crops which is not of any resistance right so here we're growing it like that so in this way a strip uh, in, this, in this strip cropping uh it's basically a parallel uh pattern of cropping of one uh, resistant uh, erosion resistant crops and on the other hand we will be just growing a normal crops and we will be um, growing these erosion resistant crops and then a normal crop so basically it's just the parallel growing of this uh, resistant crops and as well as susceptible crops to erosion so these are something on the strip cropping and now let's go to gully plugging right so when we were when we were talking about gully plugging let us try to remember that erosion right so that we have a um, thing called a gully erosion right so because of this erosion there because of the heavy water runoff they form a gully or a small or um, a creek or a, basically a break in the soil structure right it can be large as this as you can see in this picture so this is a gully right so these are basically a symptoms of a very bad uh, land disorders right so it can also be uh, resulted due to improper land use and these are also visible as uh, as a result of a severe soil erosion okay so here we form a small drainage channels right so and these cannot be uh, crossed by normal agricultural equipment okay so to this uh to to cover this or to amend this a form called gully plugging is made which will help in helping the having all the agricultural activities through this gully right so here what we would do is that um vegetation plantings or bush bush work check dams or boulder buns brick earthen buns or combination of both sand band these are made across these gullies okay so in the, for example you can just see here right so these are something on the gully plugins so the, in this way they will also help in the reducing the water runoff and reducing the soil erosion so it will create so the water when it falls on the ground it won't be uh, degrading the soil more right so because of this structure in between we can also conserve the water through this okay so these are something on the gully plugging Right now, let's go to our contour bunding. Contour bunding we've already discussed before, right? So these are also mostly like the contour buns, right? So it can be in a hilly region, right? So here, uh, the measure involves construction of a rise of the lines of small earthen or 
boulder buns and poke the spooky line. We've also discussed about the lamp, so we'll be, we'll be constructing a buns like this, right? Right, in that way, Lee will also save you water. You can have a storage of water, right? And here in this buns, we can also grow an agriculture plants or any other uh, plant, plant. We can also do some plantation. So, this buns, okay? So, these buns. This will act as a barrier to flow of the water and at the same time it will also impound water to build up the soil moisture storage. Okay, so these are something on the um, contour bunding. And now let's go to a last one which is on a stream bank protection. Okay, so this stream bank protection, these are eroding stream banks as you see in the riverside, right? So they're due to the stream flow of these the sides of the lands or the soil these have these are also eroded at the same time right so to this these eroding stream bank protection these are a system or these are a technique which will help in this right so these eroding stream banks that they no, not only they uh, damage the adjoining agricultural lands but they also contribute a large quantities of sediments load to the river system as well okay so under this water management program the bank protection of only small minor streams are usually included in this okay however the work of this uh, nature should be taken just to justify the cost of the construction as well because the work usually involved are in the nature uh, boulder pitching on the banks of say about around 20 to 30 centimeter thickness right so and then uh, the the flow the velocity of the stream where the flow velocity of the stream is high which will be about say 1.5 meter per 1.5 meter per second right so in this type where the stream flow is high the velocity stream flow is high then we will build a gabion structures right and uh, on top of the bank with the foundation will be uh, the foundation will be uh, mostly uh, properly embedded in the stream of the bank right so these are something on the stream bank protection now let's go to our another topic which is on agro -pro uh, processing so agro processing is basically involved or it refers to the subset of the manufacturing that processes the raw materials and intermediate products derived from the agriculture sector so in agro, agro processing is basically involved from the raw material we'll be producing another uh, products right mm -hmm. so these all these involves all these manufacturing processes are known as are known as the agro processing so these agro processing industries they transform products originating from agriculture forests and fisheries into products which can be used by us by the humans by the people right so these are this is the main function of an agro processing Right, so hence the agro scope of the agro progress uh, processing industries they encompasses all operations from the stage of harvest till the material reaches the end that is the consumer. Okay, so it all would also uh, involve packaging, pricing, quality, quantity check, all of that. Okay, and these agro processing. Um, there are in, in the country like India, this there is an inadequate uh, attention towards the agro processing sector, right? In the past as well, but but now there is in rise due to the rising in Indian economy, agro processing has also now has been stepping up, right? So in that view, a large potential can be seen for the growth and likely for more of the socio-economic impact, specifically for the. Um, for the uh, for the employment as well as the income generation can also be helped through this right so these um so there has been estimates in most of the developed countries that up to 14 percent of the total work force is engaged with these agro processing sectors but in uh in india it's only about three percent which is uh mostly uh, engaged with these agro processing sectors right and now let's go to our different organizations which deal with uh, agro processing which is in india okay so these uh, apeda the first one is apeda the agriculture and processed food products export development authority okay so it was established by the government of india under the apeda act which was passed by the parliament in the year 1985 on december okay try to remember this and now this apera is also um, engaged with different kinds of products ranging from fruit, vegetables, right, meat products, to dairy products, to honey processing, to um, cashews, to bread processing, through all these 
and the products are related to our dig these apera controls all of these functions right of these responsibilities of the development right so in here these these are also related to uh, all these cocoa products, chocolates of all kinds, confectioneries, the biscuits and the bakery products, floriculture, florical, uh, floriculture, uh, the medicinal products as well. All these, they all come under these uh, agro-processing units, right? So these, which makes it very important in the economic sector for the economic of the country as well, right? So these, uh, APEDA is actually under the Ministry of Commerce and Industry. Okay, so now let's go to another one, which is CSIR, CFTRI, which is also known as the Central Food Technology Research Institute. Okay, so this has 42 national research laboratories in India, right? So it was set up in the 80s of the Council of Scientific and Research, Industrial Research, right? So it was first named as this under the Council of Scientific and Industrial Research. Okay, and now we have it was opened on 21st October 1950 in Mysore, Karnataka. Right, so they have also an extended resources in Hyderabad, Lucknow, and Mumbai, rendering technical assistance to numerous, numerous entrepreneurs. Right, so now we have a third one, which is another one which is known as the Central Institute of Fisheries Technology. So this was set up in 1957. This is the only national center in the country where research in all disciplines relating to fishing and fish processing is undertaken. So remember this, this is very important, right? And the institute started functioning at Cochin in 1957, okay? So this research center is function at Veraval, which is in Gujarat. We have Vishkapatnam, which is in Andhra Pradesh, and Mumbai, which is in Maharashtra. Okay, so these are some of the organizations we deal with the agro-processing in India. And now let's go to our controlled and modified atmospheric storages. So controlled and modified atmospheric, uh, atmospheric storages, these are technologies for extending the shelf life of the food, right? Especially the perishable foods such as fruits, vegetables, right? And even meat, right? So these are some of the um, products or the food which can which are easily perishable right so these uh these are also used for eliminating pests in the stored grains and as well as in their own seeds so the main important application of this controlled and modified atmospheric st storage is the long-term storage of apples okay so this is main um but the shelf life of certain other fruits pears sweet cherries and vegetables can also be extended by these methods so it is mostly used for apples okay so the main remember the main principle behind the control and modification uh, of these atmospheric technologies is to reduce the rate of respiration these rate of respiration reduce microbial growth retard enzymatic spoilage by changing the gaseous environment surrounding the product so these are the main uh, principles or the objectives why we go for this controlled and modified storages okay so these controlled and uh, modified storages these are usually achieved by reducing the concentration of oxygen right so when there is high respiration then there will be high ethylene production in that way it will ripen more and it will ripen faster this in reducing its shelf life Okay, so this is required, uh, we can also done by adding an inhibitory gas such as carbon dioxide. So increasing the carbon dioxide will reduce the um, uh, respiration rate. And you can also add a carbon monoxide, okay, carbon dioxide as well as carbon monoxide. So these, uh, the balance between this oxygen and the carbon dioxide is very, actually very critical, right? So. Um, so in that way, we have to manage these uh, flow of the gas gases in a proper manner, okay? And the major difference between this uh, controlled atmospheric storage and modified atmospheric storage is that in controlled atmospheric storage, we can control, take control over the storage uh, gases, uh, storage atmosphere, okay? So, but then whether, uh, whereas in this modified atmospheric packaging, we cannot control the uh, storage atmosphere. Okay, so basically, uh, in this modified atmospheric packaging, we change the composition of the gas in the container with a fixed mixture. Uh, so the mixture is usually fixed, but in controlled, uh, in controlled atmospheric packaging, uh, the desired gas composition can be changed, right? So in such a way that they might be having higher 
carbon dioxide or maybe lower oxygen level right so these can be helped in these metabolic activities of the vegetables and and the fruits right so these are some of the main differences between this controlled atmospheric packaging and modified atmospheric packaging okay and now let's go to our perishable food storage so when we're talking about perishable food the first thing that comes in our head is fruits and vegetables so these are the most perishable foods right to uh, and these food storage uh, includes the fruits and vegetables fresh meat which are also which can also be uh, purchased from the chilled cabinets freshly cooked food stored to be used later so these are all these all come under these food perishable food storages okay and how do we store this food normally we see in every household we have these refrigerators right so in that way cold uh, storage cold uh, temperature helps in storing these perishable foods for a longer time okay so here um see how some of the fruits and vegetables however they require store quite well out of the refrigerator as well okay but and other generally normally in all the perishable food they have to be stored properly in the refrigerator for to sustain it more longer to increase its shelf life right and so uh, this refrigeration can subsequently reduce the rate uh, at which the food will deteriorate okay so low temperature it will slow down the growth of microorganisms and the rates of chemicals including the enzymatic conditions or the changes in the food okay so these are the two main cause of spoilage so remember these points right the first one here is that slow downing the uh, slowing down the uh, microorganisms and the rate of enzymatic changes in the food okay so these are something on some of the perishable food storage and now let's go to our storage structures so in uh, storage uh, structures these are mostly uh, involves with the silo which is basically done in a bulk and we also have another one which is conventional storage known as a go down which we normally see here and there everywhere right so india is most in in india since a developing country a lot of agriculture products or producers are usually stored in a a uh, conventional uh, store or a place known as a go down right so these uh the side walls of these go downs they are usually made from bricks or cements right but here in this um can also be made from a galvanized iron as well right so but here in the silo type of storage structures these are either constructed from steel or from a reinforced concrete so these are mostly used in those high uh factories so the first one here is on the um silo type of structures right so here there it is a modern facilities for storing grains which is in bulk these are known as silos okay so these are constructed from steel or in a reinforced concrete so there are a cluster of adjoining silos in a modern large capacity processing unit so you can just see here in this picture that these are usually round containers big round containers right so these are adjacent to place adjacent to each other okay so these are circular and conical in bottom and the bulk storage for bins grains can be made for reinforcement concrete plain or corrugated galvanized sheet mild steel black sheet aluminium sheet fiberglass brick cement etc right so these are some uh, some of the subs on the silo type of storage right and but uh basically in india the mild steel bins and rcc bins these are the most common type of structures for the silo type okay so we also have some of these certain uh, advantages of this the first one here is that it is less expensive and easier handling and it also helps in the quality control so the second one here is it it requires a lesser space requirement and number sec third is saving cost of bags Right, since we are already storing it in a bulk in the steel, so we don't have to uh, spend money on bags, right? So another one here is provi provision of the automation and mechanization for quicker handling and maintaining quality of the stored products. Since will be uh, it's provided with aut uh, automatic supplies and automatic devices, so in that way there will be a more specific, and precise, and more uh, quicker handling on maintaining of the quality products, right? And the third one, the fifth one here is protection from losses due to birds and rodents. Right? Suppose, for example, if you store it in a go down or uh, in a place in a closed environment that 
we always face a problem of rodents here and there. Even in our homes also, we always face a problem of rodents. So this will uh, cut off the problem of rodents and birds, which will make damage to the rain. And now let's go to our shed, which is also known as a warehouses, or it is also known as a godown. So uh, here in the picture, I've given a uh, pic. So here in this, I've just given a picture of a godown, right? And now it is a horizontal shed which has been used to provide low cost large volume storage. Okay, so remember it is low cost but it is a large volume storage. So the very large volume sheets can also be constructed by Food Corporation of India, which is also known as FCI, for storing grains and other products. Right, so here the sheds, these are usually made of steel or corrugated sheet construction with the flat concrete floors. Okay, so these are something on the uh, go downs or shed. Right, so these uh, sh uh, shed or the warehouses are right now, even now, it is mostly used for everywhere. It's used for storage of all these agricultural products and all the agricultural goods. And from there only, all the supplies will go out to the markets and therefore reach the consumers, right? So um, these are something for today's uh, topic. And please don't forget to subscribe and press the bell icon for further notifications. Right, so and if you guys have liked the video, don't forget to hit the thumbs up button as well. Uh, we'll be meeting for the next session.